The key thing to understand in ecology is that all organisms have relationships. For example, mice have relationships with other mites, with the plants that they eat, with the predators that eat them, and with all of the other animals that live nearby. They also have relationships with the environment itself. For example, they'll breathe in oxygen from the air, and breathe out carbon dioxide. Or they'll burrow holes in the soil, which can increase irrigation and so improve the quality of that soil. Because of all these relationships, if any one part of the ecosystem changes, for example the mouse population falls, it can affect all other parts of the ecosystem. So in this case, it could mean that predators have less food and soil quality decreases. Before we go any further, it's worth running through some of the special terms that you need to know for ecology. The first is habitat, which is just the place where an organism lives. So for our mice, that could be a field, a forest, or somebody's basement. Meanwhile, a population is all of the organisms of a particular species that live in that habitat. So all the mice that live in the field. Next, we have the community, which is all the populations of different species that live together in a habitat. So the community would involve not only the mice, but also the owls, the plants, and any other organisms that live in that field. Two more terms are biotic factors, which are the living factors of the environment, like the availability of food or the number of predators, and abiotic factors, which are the non-living factors of the environment, like temperature and soil pH. We'll take a closer look at these two in our next video, as they're both a bit harder to understand. If we put all of these together, so the habitat, the community that lives there, and all of the biotic and abiotic factors, what we have overall is the ecosystem, which we could describe as the interaction of a community of living organisms with the non-living parts of their environment. And ecology is really about understanding how these ecosystems function, and also how they might change in the future. One of the most important processes in an ecosystem is competition. If you think about any organism, it's going to need a range of different resources to survive. For animals, this usually includes things like space, which we can call territory, food, water, and also mates, so that they can reproduce. Meanwhile, plants need things like light, space, and water and mineral ions, which they get from the soil. The problem is that all of these resources are limited. So to make sure they get enough of them, organisms have to compete with each other. And this competition might be between organisms of different species, like when lions and hyenas compete for a wildebeest, or between organisms of the same species, such as when male deer compete with each other for females. The last key term we need to cover is interdependence, which is the idea that all species depend on other species in some way. We can see how this works with a food web, which show the feeding relationships within a community. So here, we can see that mice, rabbits, and grasshoppers all feed on the grass. And then the shrews and sparrows feed on the grasshoppers, and so on. The important thing to understand here, though, is that if anything happens to one of these species, then it will affect all of the others. For example, take a second to think about what might happen if the mouse population suddenly increased. Well, as all these mice need food, they'd start eating the grass, which would mean that there was less grass available for the rabbits and grasshoppers, so their populations would fall. Meanwhile, the hawks would suddenly have a lot more mice to eat, so their population might increase. However, as they also feed on rabbits, and we just said that there would be fewer rabbits, the hawk population might not actually increase all that much. And if we wanted to, we could go on to describe the effects on all the other species too, such as how the decline in grasshoppers could lead to a decline in the shrew and sparrow populations as well. 
there's no need to remember any specific examples. You just need to understand how these relationships work and be able to predict the knock-on effects of any changes. Anyway, that's all for today. So I hope you found it useful and we'll see you next time.